So good morning everyone. Yesterday we were talking about uh, different kinds of transport mechanisms that led to concrete durability problems. Let's continue our discussion on that. We first saw that uh, there are many different transport mechanisms that either happen individually or in combination depending upon the kind of service environment. We started talking about diffusion which is basically the flow under a con concentration gradient. So ionic species will tend to diffuse through semi-permeable barriers from locations of high concentration to locations of low concentration. And this will happen until there is some sort of an equilibrium reached in this process. When gases diffuse through concrete, they primarily need an unsaturated medium. That means they need very little moisture in the system, preferably no moisture for the gas to diffuse easily. Whereas when you have ionic species, they generally diffuse through saturated or partially saturated concrete. So we are talking about chloride induced corrosion, where chloride ions are diffusing from the external environment into the concrete. And this happens primarily in locations like underwater or where you have a lot of moisture available in the atmosphere to carry these chlorides inside. Whereas when we talk about carbonation, we essentially look at conditions for the concrete that are mostly dry, in which case the carbon dioxide penetration can happen over a long distance into the concrete. Okay? So uh, and uh, when we talk about molecule, molecular diffusion like water, pores have to be relatively large to accommodate these molecules to penetrate. Now, we talked also about two different cases. One is steady state diffusion, where the properties of the material do not change with respect to time. That means when the concentration gradient is the same, okay, its variation across the depth of the material will still be the same. And this is applicable to the very thin layers and especially when you have gaseous diffusion happening through the system. Okay. And this is defined by Fick's first law of diffusion, where the diffusion flux J is related to the concentration gradient through a proportionality constant that is your diffusion coefficient. So the material characteristic that you need to evaluate to understand the resistance of the material to diffusion is the diffusion coefficient d. Okay. Now when you come to concrete, we know very well that with time the properties of concrete undergo changes. With additional hydration, the structure of concrete develops even more and because of that you have a change in the rate at which the diffusion can happen as time progresses forward. Okay. Because of this, we cannot apply a steady state condition to concrete and we go with non-steady state uh, condition and in this fix second law of diffusion is used and you have the time variability of the concentration related to the spatial variability of the concentration related by a diffusion coefficient. Now uh, as we discussed yesterday, the solution of this PDE requires the use of an error function but one important aspect to understand is this factor d which we otherwise call as a diffusion coefficient, that itself is something which is not going to be constant throughout the service life of the concrete. Because what you measure at 28 days may be quite different from what you measure at 56 days or 90 days or 1 year. Okay? So this value of d also is evolving with time. In other words, d is basically a time dependent diffusion coefficient. That is why we call it an apparent diffusion coefficient. It is not really the true diffusion coefficient because a true diffusion coefficient will be independent of the time time at which you are evaluating it. So this is an apparent diffusion coefficient because it is time dependent. Okay? So you need to be careful about your measurement of this diffusion coefficient based on experiments done on concrete. You need to exactly specify the age at which you have determined this value. Okay? Now how do we measure this diffusion coefficient? As far as steady state equations are concerned or steady state condition is concerned, all you have to do is measure the chloride concentration upstream and downstream. You know the thickness of your material, you apply the direct first law of uh, fixed first law and you can directly get your diffusion coefficient. Okay? But that does not work in the case of materials like concrete with the changing their characteristics with respect to time. For second law, what we have to, uh, for unsteady state diffusion, we need to do chloride ponding experiments. So here you have a tub filled with chloride and you put your cylindrical concrete specimen within this tub. And what happens is the chlorides will tend to diffuse unidirectionally from the top of the concrete specimen. So you need to cover the perimeter using something impervious like an epoxy coating okay, so that the chlorides do not penetrate through the coating. They only penetrate unidirectionally. And from time to time all you have to do is section off the concrete with respect to depth and powder it and measure the extent of chloride which is varying with the function of the depth of the concrete. Okay. So that is what you do, you basically do chloride ponding and measurement of chloride content along the depth of the concrete which can 
then be fitted using the error function to determine the diffusion coefficient. Again, this is what is depicted here. This is covered in a standard ASTM C1556. It is also known, known as a bulk diffusion test. The older version of the bulk diffusion test was a ponding test in which you had to actually create a slab of concrete and put sodium chloride solution on the top. That means you pond the sodium chloride solution on top of the concrete. But th then the process is similar. You need to take cores through the concrete from time to time and determine the chloride profile. That means the extent of chloride concentration along the depth of the concrete. Okay. So here you have 16.5% uh, sodium chloride solution is what is used and chloride profiling is done with a profile grinder what is shown on this side here or you can even have uh, a more uh, uh, workshop oriented process like a lathe. You can use a lathe to section off the concrete layer by layer and then determine the extent of chlorides inside. Okay. So based on this, so again this is again a schem schematic which is showing the cylindrical concrete sample sitting inside a tub of sodium chloride solution. Of course, here is present in terms of molarity 2.8 molar that corresponds to about 16.5 percent sodium chloride. Okay. So, that is a very uh, aggressive, very uh, uh, concentrated solution of sodium chloride. Okay. So, of course, we want to accelerate the test. So, we use a very high concentration of sodium chloride in this case. And based on the diffusion coefficient value d that you get, okay, the apparent diffusion coefficient values, uh, there is a qualitative classification given for the resistance to chloride penetration. This is not standardized. Okay. I mean these values are not standardized. The test is standardized, but these values are not standardized. They are based on an assimilation of different literature which is uh, looked at data collected from various different sources. Okay. You you will hear this term, uh, this person's name quite often, Nielsen. He is one of the premier researchers who has worked on chloride diffusion through concrete. So, this data was published by Nielsen's group that uh, a concrete which had less than 2.5 into 10 power minus 12 meter square per second of apparent diffusion coefficient would show an extremely high resistance to corrosion. And on the other hand, greater than 15 into 10 power minus 12 would be the concrete sufficiently very poor in terms of the resistance to chloride induced corrosion okay, or chloride penetration. Okay, please remember this is only <coughs> chloride diffusion, right? We are not talking about how that leads to corrosion of the steel we are still only talking about how much chloride can actually get into the system. So, this is the resistance to chloride penetration that the bulk diffusion test is telling you. So, we, we need to use the right terminology always. We need to ensure that we are addressing what is being measured correctly. Okay. So, when you come to the next few tests, when we talk about migration for instance, you will see that the chloride is driven into the concrete under a potential gradient and not a diffusion and uh, not really a concentration gradient. Okay. So, that is something that we need to address properly by using the right terms. Now, the other diffusion test is the carbonation test. So, here you are subject your concrete to accelerated carbon dioxide environments because the wh what is the carbon dioxide content of uh, atmosphere? Point 0.03 or 0.04, yeah, 0 0.04 percent is the extent of CO2 in the atmosphere. So, if you leave your specimens out for natural carbonation, it will take a long time for you to get the result which indicates the potential for the material to resist CO2 propagation into the concrete. Now, for that what we do is we create these chambers where we can control the temperature and the humidity to an extent which maximizes the rate of carbonation. We also choose a high level of CO2. So, CO2 level could be 1 percent, 3 percent or sometimes people have used even 50 percent inside these chambers. So, we are simulating an accelerated CO2 environment. Of course, uh, this 50 percent or 100 percent CO2 is something totally unrealistic. So, most people tend to prefer between 1 and 4 percent as valid uh, concentrations of CO2 inside the chamber. Okay. So, you need to control temperature, humidity and CO2 concentrations and from time to time you need to split your specimen and spray phenolphthalein on it. Now, phenolphthalein you have used earlier in chemistry, it is a good acid base indicator. So, beyond a certain pH, okay, you will start seeing a colorless band on the surface of the concrete. So, when carbonation happens, CO2 penetrates the concrete, the CO2 interacts with the calcium bearing species in the concrete and leads the concrete to become more and more acidic. So, the pH keeps reducing. So, when the pH crosses about 11.5 or, or 11 or sometimes even less than that about 10.5, the phenolphthalein would indicate a colorless 
concrete. For all pH levels above that, it will indicate a pink concrete. So, concrete inside is obviously not carbonated. Concrete at the surface is carbonated in this case. You can measure the depth of carbonation and then with respect to time when you plot this depth, what you generally obtain, I will show you some data later. When you plot this again square root of time, you get a linear relationship. The depth of penetration of CO2 plotted against the square root of time gives you a linear relationship. What does that mean? If you plot against time, what will happen? You will get a quadratic relationship which sort of starts tapering off towards the end. Okay? That is why when you plot it against square root of time, you get a linear relationship. Why does it taper off? Why does the rate of penetration of CO2 drop with respect to time? Probably not saturation. What is actually happening is your surface zones are getting converted to calcium carbonate. There is densification happening. So, the penetration of CO2 is going to get reduced with respect to time. Okay? So, with normal ordinary potent cement concrete, you will see that the densification caused by the surface conversion of lime to CO, uh, CaCO3, calcium carbonate, tends to densify the concrete and that slows down the rate at which your CO2 further propagates. So, you start seeing a limiting sort of a relationship. So, that is why when people plot it, when you plot it against the square root of time, you get a, that is not very linear, you get a linear relationship. Okay? And the advantage here is you can actually then take the slope of this and call it the carbonation rate. And that carbonation rate can further be used for modeling the concrete or understanding the service life of concrete exposed to a carbonation environment. Okay? Now, that would obviously mean that you consider that once the carbonation depth reaches the level of the reinforcing steel, because of the acidic conditions prevailing, the steel will start corroding at that point of time. Okay? It does not address the fact that when carbonation happens, the moisture content is rather low in the system and the steel would need moisture to actually corrode. So, there is a dichotomy here. On one stage, you need less moisture or partially saturated or unsaturated concrete for the CO2 to propagate into the concrete. Okay? On the other hand, you need moisture to ensure that the corrosion propagates in a regular fashion. So, there is lack of moisture for CO2 penetration, but you need moisture for corrosion. So, although carbonation depth may be high in certain instances, you may not get the associated corrosion that takes place for the reinforcing steel, even though the pH conditions are ideally suited for the corrosion to happen okay, because of the moisture availability being a criterion that determines whether corrosion happens or not. Anyway, we will talk about that again later when we discuss corrosion in more detail. The other major transport mechanism that occurs in concrete is permeation. Now, permeation or permeability is associated with the flow under a hydraulic gradient, a pressure gradient. Okay? So, saturated liquid transfer happens which is controlled by a pressure gradient across the concrete. So, if you have high pressure of water on the outside, low pressure on the inside, obviously it will drive the water into the concrete. Now, the ionic species that are dissolved in water can also move because of permeation. Ionic species do not always have to move because of diffusion. They can also be carried by the water into the concrete. For example, sulphates which are dissolved in water inside the ground water can get carried by water into the concrete because of permeability. So, permeation obviously is higher when there are cracks and defects present in the concrete. So, obviously water does not have to diffuse or, or permeate through regions of porosity, it can permeate directly through the cracks and defects in the concrete. And you know this equation quite well, Darcy's law which is uh, under steady state conditions again. What does it mean? What does steady state condition mean for permeation? You have a saturated condition and secondly you have a similar pressure gradient at all points of time. So, time time invariance of the pressure gradient exists. So, here, so the flow is given in terms of the permeability coefficient k multiplied by the area of cross section across which the permeation is happening multiplied by the pressure gradient, the difference in pressure divided by the length over which the difference exists. Okay? So, this k here is called the coefficient of permeability and often times we convert this into what is known as intrinsic permeability, which is actually a material property. This coefficient of permeability is determined experimentally, but it is also related to a more fundamental material property called intrinsic permeability D, which is equal to viscosity of the fluid multiplied by the permeability coefficient measured by permeability experiments divided by 
the density of the fluid multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity g. So, that is a more important parameter for us to get from this equation. The only difficulty is setting up this kind of an investigation for concrete can be quite difficult because now you are talking about subjecting a concrete to water pressure on one side and then making this water come out on the other side. Okay, water has to actually flow out of the concrete and you need to wait until the rate of flow at the up, uh, downstream end is constant to get the steady state condition. Yeah, the rate of flow which is coming at the downstream end should become constant. So, imagine it will take you a long time for that to be achieved. First of all, for water to come out through the pores of the concrete itself will take a very long time and after the water comes out and establishes a steady, steady state, your concrete would have already matured by 10 to 12 days beyond the point where you started the test. So, that what I am saying is to take that, to get that steady state, you need to wait at least 10 to 14 days and in that time concrete has matured already significantly. So, because of that you are not really capturing the true properties of concrete at that point of time. So, it is a difficult uh, aspect to establish. Now, when you are talking about uh, gaseous diffusion under pressure, you use the hagen poiseuille equation which is also quite similar. You have the diff squares of difference in pressures and then you are related to the amount of flow that is happening for the gas through the concrete. So, water permeability is a common experiment which is done and has been standardized in most codes. Unfortunately, it is not something that is easy to conduct. Basically, it measures the steady state permeability coefficient for water under a constant pressure head. Now, you know very well, we just discussed now attainment of steady state takes a long time. So, because of that, this test has been suitably modified by different standards to not just look at the flow at the other end, but stop the test when the con uh, water has penetrated the concrete by a certain distance. So, for example, you apply the same pressure but instead of making the water penetrate the entire distance and flow out of the concrete, you stop the test after 2 or 3 days, split the concrete open and measure the depth of water penetration and use that as an indicator of the durability. The only dif difficulty is there is you cannot apply any law to determine the permeability coefficient. You only have an arbitrary parameter that is equal to the depth of water penetration and you use that as a durability characteristic to classify the concrete characteristic. Okay? So, these are two different methodologies. One is obviously looking at the flow rate of water flowing out through the concrete, the other is the depth of penetration of water after a certain amount of time. Okay? Now, this one, the other disadvantage with the water permeability test is that sealing the sides of the concrete can be a really difficult task because you want the water to actually flow through the concrete and not from the sides. So, sealing the sides and ascertaining that water does not flow on the sides, that takes a very long time also to set up. So, this test is not easy and nobody seems to be using these tests. Uh, this test nowadays. Okay. What people prefer is the water penetration test. So, we cannot call it a water permeability test anymore, we call it water penetration test under pressure and this has been standardized by German standards DIN, DIN 1048. Now, of course, this is also now an EN standard, I am sorry I do not have the EN number for this. It was originally a German standard, but now it is an EN standard. So, this is the water permeability apparatus that is there in our laboratory. So, here this uh, graduated tube here tells you the amount of pressure that you have set up for the water in the system and this is your concrete specimen which is tightly sealed on the top and bottom to ensure that there is no leakage of the water from the sides. So, this water basically comes through that tube there, penetrates the concrete and after 3 days of application of 0.5 mega Pascal pressure or 5 bar pressure for 3 days. After that, you split the concrete open and measure the depth of penetration. So, this is showing you the depth of penetration of the con water into the concrete. Now, one thing you need to understand is this test method does not call for a particular conditioning of the concrete sample to be done. That means, the concrete should be directly taken from the moist curing and subjected to this water penetration. Sometimes what may happen if the concrete is of a poor quality that after moist curing, your entire concrete is totally saturated. right? Now, when you do the permeability experiment, it is very difficult to actually get a clear idea about the depth of penetration when you split open the concrete. For concretes that are having lesser water cement ratios, it is quite easy to get this result because you will see a clear band of water moving through the concrete. But for concrete with high water cement ratios, this can actually get quite difficult. So, in those cases, you might want to subject your concrete specimens to some preconditioning. That means, you dry it for a certain period of time and then do the test. 
but for most for the most part this test method is prescribed for concretes without any preconditioning that means you directly take it from the moist condition and test it only then we can apply a direct permeation law otherwise what is going to happen if the concrete is dry what will it also do it will absorb because it is drier than the water it is going to absorb water and then you will have other mechanisms apart from permeation also which are acting in the same experiment that is the reason why the code specifies that you need to use this concrete in a saturated state directly taken from moist curing. <coughs> now there is also a non destructive instrument from German instrument this is not German okay the previous test was German and this test is German. German is a company based in Norway which makes uh, non destructive test instrumentation for concrete and here what they have done is they have made this special apparatus which has a water filled chamber which can be fixed to the surface of the concrete. So, you can actually take this to any concrete surface horizontal or vertical and get the system clamped on to the concrete and then measure the actual water penetration happening when you apply pressure in the water filled chamber on the top ok. So, the principle is the same you are still applying pressure to the water to get it into the concrete, but the advantage here is that you can carry this to any real structure and do the test ok. So, pressure is kept constant using a micrometer gauge with an attached pin that reaches into the chamber the amount of adjustment that you need to give for the pressure to remain constant is then converted to the amount of water that is penetrating into the system and ultimately you get again a water permeability coefficient from this test ok. And then based on the uh, conditions that are prescribed uh, of course, this is again not a standardized test it is again covered in a, uh, a report of a RILEM committee and it tells you that for different values of permeability the concrete quality can be assessed qualitatively there is again no quantification here concrete is good normal or poor when your permeability coefficient is so much ok. There are also other devices available like this uh, there is another device called auto clamp which is also available in the market which can be used to directly fix on top of your concrete structure and determine the permeability coefficient. Now, the advantage of these non destructive measures is that now you have a chance to apply these directly on the structural concrete because the durability test on structural concrete is not really going to damage it unless you remove a specimen to do the test. If you are simply going to be doing it non destructively there is no problem at all. So, these kinds of tests can actually be applied for on site measurement of the quality of concrete apart from cover depth you can also actually directly measure the permeability coefficient. Now, gas permeability can be measured in several ways ok water permeability I told, talked about two different techniques. So, gas per permeability can be done in several ways one is by measuring the pressure rise in a vacuum cell which is placed on the concrete surface. So, you again have a cell with which you create vacuum and affix it to the concrete surface. So, the air which is flowing from the sides will tend to go through the porosity of concrete and disturb the vacuum inside the cell and that can be gauged as the permeability coefficient of the concrete ok. So, that is what is happening in this case and this test has been standardized in Switzerland it is a Swiss standard test and it is also available with an instrument called torrent air permeability tester ok and we have this instrument in our lab again this has this vacuum chamber which is connected to the concrete specimen and then it is operated using this valve to ensure that the vacuum is maintained and then the air flow happens from the concrete into this chamber which creates a pressure difference between the two chambers and that is recorded as a coefficient of permeability which is called torrent air permeability coefficient based on the name of the person who has done the development that is Mr. Torrent himself he came to our lab to we, we bought that equipment. So, luckily at that time he was also visiting India. So, visited our lab and then he demonstrated this was the first time that you actually had the inventor of an equipment demonstrate the equipment in the lab ok. So, based on this again you can have of course, from a publication from the manufacturer himself there is actually a classification for concrete quality that can be done based on the permeability coefficient in the torrent air permeability test. Now, in this case what you need to ensure is the concrete is dry we are talking about gas permeability. So, concrete has to be sufficiently dry. So, although this instrument can be used to calculate the air permeability coefficient of any real structural concrete you have to ascertain that the concrete in the structure is in a dry condition. So, before you do this test you need to determine the moisture content of the concrete at the surface and that should be less than 5.5 percent before you apply this to real structural concrete 
you need to ensure that the moisture content in the surface of the concrete is less than 5.5 percent. How do you determine moisture content in concrete? There are moisture meters available okay, which can work based on capacitance measurements and that can be used to determine the extent of moisture on the surface. Okay. Those of you who have done the non-destructive testing course have already used this moisture meter. So, moisture meters can be used to detect extent of moisture in the concrete. If it is less than 5.5, you can then go ahead with the testing of the air permeability. The other way is to apply a pressure gradient across the test specimen and monitoring the pressure decay over time. I am sorry, the word time is missing <laughs> or maybe the, the image is somehow covered that for some reason. Pressure decay over time is measured. Okay. And so, this is basically the pressure cell where you have some initial pressure maintained. You have a concrete sample sitting here and with time what is going to happen? the pressurized gas is going to flow through the concrete and then this the pr pressure that is registered in the cell is going to keep on decreasing. If you have a pressure transducer measuring the pressure, then the difference in pressures can tell you the extent of permeability of the concrete. Okay. This is captured in the oxygen permeability index test, oxygen permeability index. test and this test is standardized in South Africa. It is now being adapted in several other countries also. I will show you what this test is all about. So, here this is your pressure cell here and that is the pressure transducer that is actually measuring the pressure inside. Now, oxygen is used because you are able to describe clearly what the part, uh, the molecular size of oxygen is going to be, right? because you know the molecular mass, you know the average atomic size and so on, because of which you are able to fix very clearly how the pressure drop will be related to the permeability coefficient. If you use air, then you have a mixture of gases and converting that to a suitable equation is going to be quite difficult. Okay. So, here what we do is we have the pressure cell filled with oxygen. The concrete sample is held very tightly in a rubber collar, so that when we ensure that the concrete sample gets sealed, okay, right, the concrete expands against a rubber collar and ensures that there is no gap left behind between the concrete and the collar. So, we want the oxygen to penetrate only through the concrete and not on the sides. So, sealing that concrete in this case is very important. Okay. And then with time the oxygen gas tends to go out of the concrete and pressure decay is monitored and converted to an oxygen permeability index which is a negative log of the permeability coefficient k. Now, permeability coefficient you know will be in the order of 10 power minus 8, 10 power minus 10 like that. right? So, when you convert that to a negative log, you actually get a whole number like 8, 9, 10 like that or 8.5, 9.5, 10.4 values like that are obtained. So, now what does this tell you? If the permeability coefficient is low, the permeability index is going to be high. right? So, permeability coefficient of 10 power minus 10 means your index is going to be plus 10. So, the higher the index, the better the classification of the concrete and this has been again prescribed by the people who actually set forth this standard in the first place, the South African uh, researchers and according to them, for an OPI value of greater than 10, your concrete quality is very good, less than 9 is very poor and of course, there are intermediate values also given. What you can do now is use this sort of a qualitative classification to adjudge the kind of concrete that has been supplied for a construction project or you can even take concrete cores from the structure, subject that to oxygen permeability test and determine whether the con concrete quality is good or not. Again, in this case a 30 millimeter thick slice is taken. Okay. Why 30 millimeter thick? Because in most cases your cover concrete is about 25 to 40 millimeters. right? So, 30 millimeter thick slice means it is actually representing your cover concrete. The only difficulty here is if your concrete has very large aggregate, let us say 25 mm aggregate and you take a 30 millimeter cover, then you may get a lot of variability in your system. right? The other side of looking at that is in real in reality also when you use 25 mm aggregate, okay, you do not have much more than 30 millimeter cover. Okay. So, that is actually reflecting a real life situation. Variability can be expected and that needs to be built into the kind of assessment that you are doing for the system. Third way to measure gas permeability is keeping a constant pressure inside the chamber 
and simply measuring the gas flow which is coming on the outside and that is a European test called SEM bureau test. Principle is similar okay, just like you had for sand you must have done two different experiments the constant head permeometer and the falling head permeometer. So, the constant head permeometer is more like the SEM bureau test the falling head permeometer test is similar to the oxygen permeability test developed by the South Africans. So, again the prescription or rather the performance requirements which are stipulated by these different test methods could be quite different and you need to ensure that you are addressing the right kind of test method. The other mechanism that commonly occurs in durability or in, in service of the concrete is sorption or capillary water absorption. So, this refers to water uptake by capillary absorption into the concrete. So, this already assumes that a concrete is going to be dry or partially saturated so that it is able to suck up or absorb the water which is in the surrounding soil or the environment. So, uptake of liquid into unsaturated or partially saturated solids is covered in sorption or capillary water absorption and it is obviously going to be influenced by how much capillary porosity you have, what is the degree of connectivity of these pores, aggregates because aggregates will determine how much ITZ is available right and because of that your mix characteristics can be quite nicely captured with the help of a sorption based experiment. So, what you simply do is measure the mass of water absorbed by the concrete over time. It is quite a simple way to do it and equations that deal with sorption include capillary pressure equation which you know very well and when you solve this capillary pressure equation you get the mass of water absorbed varying as a function of the square root of time ok. Just like your diffusion of CO2 you have the same sort of a square root of time relationship between the mass of water absorbed by the system and the time taken for this to happen. So, the other way that this aspect can actually lead to a greater rate of durability problems in your concrete is wick action. You know very well that when you have a dry surface on one end and another surface that is in contact with a liquid which has ionic species or dissolved ionic species because of the wick action of the porosity that is on this side because of drying front on this side you will actually suck up more of the liquid into the system and locally your concentrations of the ionic species may actually get exceeded even beyond what is actually there in your external system. So, transport of liquid from a phase in contact with liquid to a drying phase happens and the liquid evaporates leaving behind a concentrated amount of the dissolved material. So, dissolved ions can precipitate as salts in a more concentrated fashion. So, think of it in a situation for example, if you have a column standing in a ground that has sulphate soils ok. The soil is rich in sulphate, the water is transporting the sulphates into the concrete, there is external atmosphere that is causing drying of this water. So, it is causing this water to rise up to this place here, deposit your salt solution at this interface, the water dries out leaving the salt behind. So, you can imagine that in a condition like this, the amount of damage that you will see will be much greater at the interface of the soil and air rather than deep inside the soil ok, because of this action of which we call as wick action ok. So, that is what is exactly happening in this case and of course, what we have to realize is this can happen in any condition because you are going to get drying and wetting cycles. So, in the case of drying cycles the moisture from inside is trying to get pulled out to the external environment when the moisture dries out it leaves the salt in a higher concentration at the surface and during wetting again these salts can be pushed further into the concrete. So, you have a constant change in the concentration of the specimen. So, how do you measure sorption? The simplest way is to simply take a slice of concrete and put it in a water bath where water is able to get in only from one surface of the concrete. So, what we do is we cover the perimeter of the concrete specimen to ensure that the water does not enter through the sides, it has only one way of entering through the bottom surface of the concrete. But before we subject this to sorption, the entire concrete has to be first conditioned to obtain a completely dry environment. So, conditioning methods could be quite different. So, conditioning usually involves oven drying the sample. So, one way is actually drying at 100 degrees, but more commonly what people do is dry at lower temperatures typically 50 degrees for longer duration. Why do you think people try to do this? why not dry it for 100 because you know that at 100 degrees all the water will simply go off. But what also can happen at 100 degrees is you may actually lead to more defects forming in the structure because of the extremely high level of drying ok. 
At 50 degrees, the drying is much more gradual. So you dry it for a longer duration to ensure that the water actually has a way to get out of the system, but does not really affect the kind of structure that you have inside. It does not induce additional damage or cracking inside. Okay. So that basically is how you do this test. You then plot your mass of water absorbed against square root of time. What you see is the first few hours of collection of data that you have has a nice linear correlation with the square root of time. Later, the slope of this graph may change to a much more gradual increase of water absorption into the system. So the slope of this line or linear portion in the in, for, drawn through the initial points in the curve is otherwise called capillarity index or sorptivity index okay. and that can be used as a durability parameter to assess the quality of concrete. So this is again a sorptivity test which is prescribed by the South African durability index manual. There is also an ASTM test which I have not given here ASTM C1585. There is an ASTM test that also measures the same sorptivity. Only thing is there is a difference in the way that the results are interpreted. In the ASTM test, the sorptivity is given in terms of millimeter per square root of second. Okay. In the South African test, it is converted to millimeter per square root of R. Okay. So here, what we are simply doing is measuring the slope that is given by this. So this is, this is obviously going to be grams square root of R, but this gram is going to get converted to millimeter based upon the amount of water rising the column of water, equivalent column of water. So based on this test, again a qualitative criteria can be used to adjudge the quality of your concrete. Again the sample is 30, 30 millimeters thick and the advantage that the South Africans have done is uh, you can extract the core sample and slice it to 30 millimeters. First use it for the oxygen permeability test because again you are drying it for that test anyway. Conduct that test and then use it for sorptivity test. So that way you can do two tests for the same specimen. Now, the most common test that everybody does is an absorption test. So this refers to the bulk uptake of water. So you take a concrete specimen, dry it until it achieves a constant weight, then put it inside water, under water for a certain period of time. So there will be a lot of absorption and you wet it until it achieves a constant weight and measure the mass difference that gives you the extent of absorption. The only thing is of course it is difficult to penetrate all the pores of concrete because you are relying on the water outside trying to get inside on its own. So you can actually improve this process by boiling the water. When you boil the water, what happens? Surface tension decreases, it is able to penetrate more and more into the system. Another alternative is to vacuum saturate the concrete. You put the dry concrete inside water and put it inside vacuum. So you are then forcing the water to enter the porosity which is otherwise not easily accessible. But end point is the same, you are making water penetrate the pores of the concrete and measuring the extent of absorption that may happen. This is similar to the absorption test that is done for aggregate. Only thing in aggregate cases we do not use boiling water or vacuum saturation, we use normal water absorption. This is the easiest to measure, it is covered in ASTM regulation C642 and in this case you can also measure the porosity of the system because again the water is accessing all the pores that are available from the surface. So you get a measure of your porosity of the system also. Okay, now the bulk of the tests that we look at as far as concrete is concerned either deal with water absorption or water penetration or the use of chloride related test methods that are based on migration. The migration is movement of ionic species driven by difference in electrical potential. So in other words, you have some liquids on either side of your concrete, you apply a potential difference. What you will end up doing is make the ionic species in the liquid move through the concrete to a location of lower concentration. So for example, if you have sodium chloride on one side and sodium hydroxide on the other side, what you will end up doing is when you have this potential difference created between the electrodes, the chlorides will be driven through the concrete to the positively charged electrode. Okay, so you are trying to create this potential difference and drive the ionic species through the concrete. The complicated scenario here is when you apply this potential gradient, there is OH minus sodium hydroxide is there, sodium is there in the solution, sodium is there inside the concrete, potassium is there inside the concrete, calcium is there, hydroxyl, sulphate, all these ionic species are present inside your concrete and in the external solution. So when you apply the potential difference, all these ionic species start moving. So the resultant charge that you are passing through the concrete is not truly a 
true indicator of what is happening in the concrete. Okay? It is a collection of all these ionic movements that is actually happening. Because of this, the migration based tests cannot be taken as a direct representation of penetration of these chlorides into the concrete. You have to take it in terms of just the value that you are getting. You cannot really apply it to de determine a chloride diffusion coefficient. Uh, you can apply the Nernst Planck equation which looks at the potential gradient and relates that to the diffusion or permeability of the material or ionic species happening inside this medium. So, measurement of migration is typically done by inducing an electric field by two electrodes which are connected to a potential stat and then the cathode is in the upstream cell and anode is the downstream cell. And then what you do is you drive the potential difference and you look at the amount of charge that is then passing through your concrete. So, this is done using several different ways of measuring it. You, the one common me method which is quite easy to use even on site is the Wenner 4 probe resistivity test. So, here you have 4 probes that are equally spaced that are placed on the concrete surface. You apply a current through the external probes, through the external probes that are cur there is current applied and then you determine the voltage or potential drop across the inner probes. You determine the potential drop across the inner probes and convert that potential drop to the resistivity rho which is equal to 2 pi times spacing times the potential that is measured between the inner probes divided by the current that is passed in the system 2 pi s v by i. Now, resistivity you know very well that concrete is going to be conducting through its interconnected porosity. When there is interconnected porosity only conduction will happen. Okay. So, resistivity is the opposite of conductivity. right? So, if the concrete has a very less amount of interconnectivity of pores, the resistivity is expected to be high. That means, a durable concrete will have a higher resistivity. So, you can use the same test to then classify your concrete in terms of resistivity with respect to how easy it will be for ionic species to flow in the concrete and lead to conditions of corrosion. So, again resistivity gives you a direct measure of your permeability or interconnectivity of the pores in the system. But what is one major drawback in this case in this experiment? Concrete has to be completely saturated. If it is unsaturated what happens? Obviously, resistivity is going to be very high because of the lack of moisture in the porosity. The porosity has to be filled with water for conductivity to happen otherwise this experiment will not make any sense. So, there is a difference of nearly 6 to 7 orders of magnitude of the resistivity between dry concrete and moist concrete. You can get that level of difference. So, again here just like your torrent air permeability test what you need to do is go with the moisture meter first determine whether your concrete is properly saturated and then conduct the test to get suitable readings. But the fact that this test is so easy to use all it needs is this probe. Of course, this is the older version of the instrument what we have currently you can put batteries and this probe is simply a stick like thing. You stick it on top of the surface you actually get a measurement of the resistivity directly. Okay. Now, the advantage here is obviously you can use this to control or to detect the quality of concrete that is being placed in the structure directly. Keeping in mind that in a real structure there is going to be reinforcement and that reinforcement may also affect the, the resistivity value because you are get, getting more conduction paths through the concrete if the reinforcement is present. So, for that what you will have to ensure is the spacing between the electrodes is small enough so that your current lines are flowing only through the cover zone of the concrete. If you use a small spacing you ensure that the current lines are only flowing through the cover zone of the concrete. In that case you are actually measuring the property of the cover zone itself. Otherwise you will have the steel also coming into the system. Okay. So, uh, there is a new Panama canal that is being constructed and uh, the researchers from Spain who are involved in this uh, construction of the Panama canal have actually employed the use of resistivity uh, measurements to determine the quality of concrete that is being supplied to the canal. So, this durability test is actually being used as a performance requirement for the concrete uh, supplied for the Panama canal. Now, the test which is most commonly used all around the world is the rapid chloride permeability test. Again, the name itself has the term permeability in it, but truly speaking it is not a permeability, permeability test, it is a migration test. Okay. So, here you have two cells, one is filled with a sodium chloride solution, 
3 percent sodium chloride, the other is filled with a 0.3 normal sodium hydroxide solution. Okay. And then you connect this to a power source where 60 volts potential difference is created between these cells. The concrete which is about 50 millimeters thick and has 100 millimeters diameter is kept between the cells and what is it, so this this is your positive side and that is the negative side. So, when you apply this potential difference you tend to drive as I showed you earlier the main purpose is to drive the chlorides from the negative cathodic end towards the anodic end and this happens through the concrete. Okay. But reality is that there are other ionic species also that are within the system that are going to, move, to be moving around. Okay. So, because of that the result that you actually measure may not be truly indicative of the resistance to chloride ion penetration. Nevertheless, people seem to be using this in that sense and even the ASTM test method that standardizes this test calls the measured property as chloride ion penetrability and if you get more than 4000 coulombs charge passing through the system in a total of 6 hours. So, this current is this potential is applied for 6 hours through your specimen and then you determine the extent of current passing through from time to time and convert that to the charge because you know that charge is equal to current multiplied by time right coulombs equal to ampere into second right. So, you convert that to a charge passed in terms of coulombs if it is more than 4000 your chloride ion penetrability is deemed to be high less than 100 it is negligible then you have these intermediate ranges in between 2000 to 4000 is moderate 100 to 1000 is very low and 1000 to 2000 is low. Okay. So, again although something quantitative like the coulomb charge pass is calculated through the concrete the interpretation of the result is still based on the quality of the concrete that is a very important thing for you to remember when you measure the strength you report the strength you do not say the concrete is nice or good if the concrete strength is 40, my concrete is excellent if the strength is 47.5, no we just say 47.5 means 47.5 strength. But here when we get a permeability of or charge pass of 3000 coulombs, we do not say that my concrete permeability is equal to 3000 coulombs, we say that the concrete quality is moderate with respect to chloride ion penetration. Okay. So, durability tests have to be interpreted in the correct fashion. So, you cannot use this in a quantitative sense. Let me tell you why if you have a poor quality concrete you expect that it is going to be having a high penetrability right when you have a poor quality concrete because again the conduction through a poor quality concrete implies that the conduction is happening through several interconnected pores. So, the poorer the quality the more the interconnected pores. So, more charge will pass through the concrete system. Okay. But then when you are driving a potential difference of 60 volts and this concrete is carrying charge that charge will tend to heat up the concrete even more. The concrete gets hotter it will carry even more charge then it gets hotter it carries even more charge and this pr process leads to a continuous heating of your concrete. The temperature differences of the order of 50 to 60 degrees Celsius can actually get created in this test okay. and then you can actually see the, uh, the boiling of these solutions actually inside the cell also when certain types of concretes are used. So, in that case when you actually calculate the permeability uh, in terms of charge passed you may, you may get values of 10,000 coulombs or 12,000 coulombs. I have seen people even reporting those things once in a while, but that is not correct. Moment it crosses 4000 you are already entering the high permeability range and you need to just stop the test. There is no point in continuing beyond that because the heat generation will push up the permeability value tremendously. The other problem is when you use materials like geopolymer we know that geopolymer is rich in alkali we put a lot of alkaline solutions inside right we, we discussed this earlier we use alkaline activators to activate the polymerization of this aluminosilicates. When you have excess of alkali loading in your concrete what do you expect will happen to its conductivity conductivity will be higher. So, when you do the RCPT test on geopolymer concrete you will obviously get a very high permeability with respect to the values that are suggested here. The concrete quality may be otherwise good if you do a water absorption test for instance you may actually get a good quality of concrete. But when you do RCPT you will end up having a very poor performance because of the conductive ionic species that are present in the system. So, you need to ensure that you are judging the quality of the concrete based on the correct test if you want to discuss the difference between different types of concretes. For example, if you use steel fiber reinforced concrete same experiment if you use long enough steel fibers there may be sufficient connectivity between steel fibers to actually provide conduction paths through the concrete. So, you need to be very careful about using this test for all types of concrete. 
The other aspect is you need to saturate the specimen before it is used in this test, so that you do not have other mechanisms also. Already it is a complicated process, there is migration, there is diffusion, all kinds of things are happening. If you have a dry specimen, there will be absorption also. So, you need to ensure that the specimen is saturated okay? and so this procedure with which this test is used also incorporates saturation of the specimen before the test is actually conducted. Okay?